you. Thank you. I'm very excited to be here and um, be a part of this. This is my first Integrate conference, so um, I am a first timer and um, as she said, an alum, and I'm very excited to be here. Um, so we're going to bring Sexy back. Okay, it didn't leave, but it's okay. We're gonna bring it back and bring it to the realm of boring businesses, so thank you all for being here today. Um, here we go, okay. Um, so I just wanted to start things off with one of my favorite marketing quotes. This is from Beth Comstock, who was the first um, vice chair of GE, and I really think this sets the stage for a lot of the things that we're gonna talk about. First, know yourself, know the customer, and then you can really innovate. Um, a little bit about me. As she said, I'm an IMC graduate. I um, have been doing marketing communications for about a decade, mostly in the nonprofit space in, um, with higher education. And um, I did IMC from 2014 to 2017. Um, these are some of the brands that I worked with. So I did work with three different universities. Uh, Texas Southern University is an HBCU in Houston. Trinity University is a private um, school in San Antonio, and then UTSA is a state school, University of Texas at San Antonio. And um, currently I work with the TASB Risk Management Fund, so that's Texas Association of School Boards. We'll talk more about that at the end. And it's a um, nonprofit that works with public education. And then I also did a stint at American Medical ID, which is a, an e-commerce company but it's a kind of a boring brand. They do um, medical, sell medical ID jewelry. So not really the most exciting jewelry to buy. <laughs> um, so that's kind of where the, the impetus for this presentation came from, is from my own experience working with these brands. Um, when you think about, let's see if it'll go silent. Nope. Um, there we go. So when you think about um, some of the brands that you maybe have taken classes, learning about. A lot of times you have these really exciting, innovative things that are happening. Maybe it's um, consumer packaged you know, um, brands or alcohol beverages or automotive. You know, those are really exciting, innovative things that are happening. And then you graduate and you work for the real world. And sure, a lot of us will work for those brands, but a lot of us also were gonna go into insurance or um, financial services or things like that. So you really have to think, how can I take those exciting, um, creative processes that I learned about and apply them to my, my daily job? So that's kind of where I'm going here. I'm gonna move my bag because I'm gonna keep tripping over it. So in the class, um, a lot of the brands that I worked with or that we talked about were the big box stores, you know, Home Depot. We talked about Netflix being a disruptor in its market. We talked about Walt Disney, Coca-Cola, those really strong brands that um, you are, are well known for the different marketing and, and communications that they did. So today, what we're gonna do is we're gonna talk about four tips um, that you can take from those brands and how you can apply them to your, you know, to your, um, to your examples. So before we do that though, I'd like to set the stage with what I consider to be the golden marketing rule, which is know your audience. And this doesn't just mean what are those segments that I'm working with, but really developing a defined persona for those audiences so that you know how they're going to interact with your, with your company. And um, that really is the first step. And if you get anything out of any of the presentations, I think over the next, you know, today and tomorrow, it's really how can you start to know who your audience is. And then after that, we're gonna do four tips. So these four tips are just the tip of the iceberg. It's not an exhaustive list by any means, but I think in a 45 minute to an hour presentation, I don't wanna overwhelm you with um, examples. So we're gonna start with these four. Um, I'm going to give some real world examples for each of these. So brands that are out there doing these, you know, using these strategies, um, how are they living that? And then at the very end, I'll talk a little bit more about how I have um, used some of those tips in my current job with my current um, boring brand. So first tip is use a spokesperson. So one of the challenges that you think about when you think of boring brands is, okay, I have this product or I have this service 
and I need to connect with someone over that. Well, people don't really like to connect over products and services. People connect with other people. So a really quick and easy way to get your brand associated with someone else is use a spokesperson. And the two types of spokespersons that I'm gonna talk about are um, a real life influencer or a fictitious character. So there's pros and cons for both of them. For a real life influencer, that can be a celebrity that you hire, that you, you know, go out and find who is a good person who um, has an audience that I wanna reach. Or it can be someone who's not necessarily a celebrity, but maybe an influencer in that field. So who has you know, access to the audience that you want your brand to reach, <clears throat> and how can you partner with them? And some of the great things about that, obviously you can capitalize on their audience, you get that instant access to that, that audience. Um, but there are some risks. You can, of course, if it is a celebrity, there's gonna be costs associated with that. And you have to think about that, incorporating that into your budget every year. Um, the other major risk that you're going to have is what if they do something wrong? <laughs> what if that person does something morally, ethically, legally that's adverse you know, or uh, counter to what you want your brand um, experience to be? That is automatically going to be associated with your brand. So I'm not gonna mention names, but you automatically think, okay, I know who those, ex who those examples are where that has gone wrong. And then you have to then backpedal and try and you know, disconnect that, um, your brand from that person that you spent so much effort putting, building up. Um, the other example would be if you created a character for your brand um, that is a spokesperson. So one of the really great things about that is if you're creating a character, that character is never gonna do something that your brand doesn't want. Um, because it's fictitious. The, the downside to that is if you have uh, multiple campaigns that use that same character, maybe the character kind of takes over and it, it, you kind of lose the, the message. You know, maybe the, the people end up knowing more about the, the character than they do about your brand. So it can be a little overwhelming. The insurance industry uses spokespersons a lot. So the ones that come to mind, you think of Flow from Progressive, um, Gecko or Geico has the Gecko, and then Allstate has two that we're going to talk about. Um, and I'm going to um, get this little video here for you. Um, the first one is the Allstate Voice, and you probably have um, heard this. So um, Allstate hired um, uh, Dennis Haysbert to be the, his, the spokesperson. Um, um, and he, let me go back into this. So he, oh, okay, it's still playing. <laughs> no, that's their other spokesperson there, is the, um, the Mayhem guy. Um, so technical stuff, okay. So Dennis Haysbert was hired by Allstate, um, and in the beginning they used him as a traditional spokesperson. He's an actor, and so he was featured in the ads. Um, but over time, they've kind of transitioned him into just being the voice, and he has such a distinct voice that you hear it, you know that's Allstate. So it's, it's kind of a, a morphing spokesperson role. Um, I read an article just last week where they said um, Allstate has a new CMO, and she, um, in advance of her coming on board this month, they are thinking of transitioning him into a more prominent role again, Dennis Haysbert, um, as a spokes traditional spokesperson. So we might see more ads with him uh, where you see him, not just hear his voice. The other um, spokesperson that they have is this character. So they do both. You know, they have the, um, the hired person, and then they have Mayhem. And um, I love this character because, again, it's something that Allstate has created. And unlike Flo from Progressive, though, um, he is a, um, he's a foil to the services that Allstate provides. So instead of being a representation of insurance services, he's really this kind of anti-hero. So any type of um, um, risk that you might think of, you can 
create a mayhem character about that. So it's really adaptable to a bunch of different scenarios. And it can play against. So, OK, you've got this anti-hero with mayhem. Well, don't worry. Allstate can come in and provide that reassurance that you're covered. Um, the other thing is that he is adaptable. So this is just a little Twitter one that they've created. The most recent campaign that they have is related to risks that you might have at your wedding. So he's, there's a bunch of Facebook videos I've seen where Mayhem is like the aunt who wants to be in all the pictures. You know, like all of those things that, you know, the fears that you may have as a bride um, about all the things that could go wrong with your wedding. So I don't know exactly what the coverage there would be. But <laughs> in any case, there, there's, um, there is uh, that. The second tip is kind of follows in that same vein of having a character or a spokesperson. So if you don't want to create a character or go and work with an outside person, think about who the most um, uh, vocal uh, spokesperson would be for your company, and that's going to be satisfied customers. So you want to think about who are the people who are already using your services or products and what um, stories they may have to tell. And one of the um, examples that I really like comes from um, a Texas brand, and it's a USAA, so they're a, a financial and insurance um, services company, and their brand is, they, they serve military and veteran families. And so they started off, USAA was United Services Automobile, Automobile Association, so they did um, auto insurance, but they have the full suite of products that they sell. And they do a really good job of taking their brand, which is very military focused, connecting it to their current customers who are military families, and making that connection there. So um, we're going to show another, another video um, before. Actually, are we going to do that next? No, we're going to talk about social proof. So um, one of the things that you, so brands make a lot of promises, right? Like we say, we're the best at this. We're the best at this. Um, believe us, we're the best. But how do consumers really know that what you're saying as a brand is the truth? Well, as a consumer, you turn to the people that you really trust. And that's the concept of social proof. So how, are, how can we validate those claims that brands are making to us? And there's a couple different ways that you can do that. Social proof can come in the form of data and numbers. So an example of that would be, that's an old example, but the McDonald's marquee, one million hamburgers sold. So that's an example like, OK, we're so awesome because so many people are buying our hamburgers. Um, so what are those data points that you can, that you can share with your con consumers? Icons or badges, this can be like the consumer reports, third party validation saying like, OK, we have the seal of approval from this trusted um, company who has rated us this way, though using those icons or badges to show that. Customer testimonials, that's another, um, we're going to talk about, you know, we're going to show an example of that. It can be a short quote that you display on your website or in social posts or things like that. Or you can use their full-blown story in an ad, which is what USAA does quite a bit, actually. Case studies um, in the B2B space, working with a client who's completed a project with you. So maybe you are a website development development company and you have a really uh, successful project that you've completed, creating a case study around that using the collaborative um, feedback from the, the client to showcase how, you, how well you did the work to show that um, customer. And then, of course, reviews. Everybody knows Amazon reviews are awesome to read, both from a um, uh, customer testimonial perspective, but then also they've developed into this own, um, their own kind of weird like marketing, you know, perspective where people use them to um, rate positively or negatively, <laughs> you know, um, products that, that you want to share. Um, and the great thing about reviews is that 85% of consumers are going to trust those reviews as much as someone that they know. So they're going, consumers are going to go online and Maybe they're researching a phone or some product that, yeah, they can get those feed, that feedback from their, um, their 
uh, peers, but they're also going to be validating that recommendation from strangers in the form of reviews. And another statistic, I thought this one was really interesting. So 59% of people believe other people like themselves are extremely valid, um, credible sources of information about brands. And sure, that's a really striking number on its own, but when you think about the other sources, so that number ties with um, academic experts. So 59% of people believe that um, academic experts are also trusted sources. And it's only one point below technical experts. So 60% of people look to technical experts as a trusted source. So when you compare technical experts, academic experts, with just everyday people, people are really putting a lot of trust and value in what their peers are saying about brands. So that's kind of interesting, and it make, makes you think, okay, well, you don't necessarily have to use a technical or academic expert. You can just use the power of everyday people's words. So USAA has a lot of commercials like this. They do um, TV commercials, um, radio commercials, um, all the different types of media. And what I really like about the, their ads is that they really take that um, military persona that the brand stands on. They take their customer stories that reinforce that brand. And they weave all these little pieces through it. So, a lot of military families will have a tradition that they pass on from parent to child of serving in the military. And so USAA really captures that and they pull that into um, a piece that they will communicate, which is members for life. And you can take your membership in USAA and pass it on to your children. So they really um, take that idea of tradition and really weave it through. Um, so that's. Part of their customer story is that, that, you, that military tradition. And I really love them. Plus, they're San Antonio, which is where I'm from. <laughs> um, so tip number three is taking your company culture and really using that. So a lot of the, um, one of the um, complaints that I hear from people who work in boring brands is, OK, I, my company is all about being the best service provider with a friendly professional brand and that doesn't work on social media. That doesn't work with those really cool innovative marketing techniques that I see other brands doing. Well, stop thinking about it as this, you know, conflict. Really take your company culture and think about ways that you can Inf infuse all of your marketing with that. You know, really take that as you know the voice rather than trying to make it fit with something that doesn't work. So we're going to talk a little bit about how that might work, and um, some of the the ways that you can think about your brand are going to be based on these types of things. So geography. Um, I'm from Texas, so using Texas in marketing is a really really easy way to say, hey, we're from here and we know the community that we're working with. But that doesn't have to be a statewide thing. It doesn't have to be a regional thing. You can, if you're a local brand, say you have a, a brick and mortar, you can go hyper local. So we're from this neighborhood and we really um, use this neighborhood in our, as a you know, cornerstone of our brand. So really use that in your marketing. Say you, um, are marketing to a subculture. Um, one of the things that I'm thinking about could be like a real estate company that works with first time buyers. You know, obviously you can use a lot of marketing themed around the, you know, the real estate thing, but really honing in on first time experience and what that might look like using that in your marketing. Industry specific terminology, one that really um, jumps out at me is as marketers, we get a lot of marketing to us. So HubSpot, you know, what are the types of things that they're using? Or Marketo, what are the types of language that they put into their marketing pieces to us that signal, hey, we're one of the group. We know what you're talking about. We know the things that you're facing on a day-to-day -day basis, that um, the challenges that you face. 
what are those key words that, uh, that your subculture or your you know, small group is uh, using that you can kind of take from it and, and you know, spout back out to them to show that you're part of that group? OK, let's see. My favorite brand of all time, H-E-B. So in Texas, there is this brand. OK, so who? has been to Texas or is from Texas. All right. Anybody from Texas? All right. Yes. Where are you from? I'm from Houston, but not Texas. Awesome. So you know H-E-B. <laughs> you, you probably love H-E-B. <laughs> so in Texas, there is a grocery store chain, and it's called H-E-B. And it's a family-owned company. And it is. Um, it was started in the Hill Country, Central Texas. And it's a very regional company. So it has been around for over 100 years. Um, and it probably could have grown really large, but they, they've kind of tempered that, and they stay regional. So it's not even pervasive throughout the state. So if you go up to Dallas and the Panhandle, there's fewer HEBs there than you know in the Austin, San Antonio. Houston even has a, a little bit more uh, competition. They're not as... Um, the market isn't as saturated there with HEB. There's still other um, grocery stores. HEB really lives up the Texas component of their brand. And um, so I'm going to ask you before I play this video, for those who have you know, maybe um, not as much experience with Texas, what are some of the things, and just shout them out, what are the, some of the things that come to mind when you think Texas? Cowboys, Cowboys deserts, OK. What else? Big hair. Big hair. Oh, that's a good one. <laughs> Dallas, for sure. <laughs> what else? Huh? Oil. Oil. Yes. What Don't else? Don't mess with Texas. That is a great one. I love that. That was a campaign. A lot of people think this is about preserving the Texas brand, but that campaign was um, a keep Texas beautiful type of thing, you know, not littering. That's an anti littering campaign. That's one of my favorite ones. Yeah. But who knows? We just, we just adopt it and use it for everything. What else? Anything else? Longhorns? Yeah. Big and bold. Big and bold. Yeah. Horses. Horses. Yes. I have never ridden a horse. <laughs> it's never too late. As a Texan, maybe I shouldn't say that. I also don't like guacamole, which is, I know. I know. I know. But I do love queso. So, you know, and tacos. So, um, OK, I'm going to play this video real quick. My heart melts when I see these commercials. So cheesy, but I love it. Um, so, <laughs> we're not going to just spend all day watching YouTube videos, people. <laughs> um, so, one of the things that I really love about this commercial is that the driver is wearing a cowboy hat. And one of the things that people from outside of Texas maybe think that that's a negative stereotype, that, oh my gosh, I can't believe they did that. But it's actually true. Like, yes, not everybody wears a cowboy hat. I don't have a cowboy hat. But it's really not uncommon to see random people wearing cowboy hats in things, in areas that you wouldn't think. Like, oh, he's driving his truck. And you know he would never do that. That's totally unrealistic. But it's actually realistic. <laughs> and so it's little things like that that HEB really knows. Like, OK, yes, we can put our truck driver in a cowboy hat in this spot and people are not going to think like, oh, that's unrealistic. The fact that he talks about Texas families. People in Texas really do take ownership of the fact that we live in Texas. We're very proud of the fact that Texas was its own country before joining the union. And so we, we, we believe like we're Texas first, you know. I did not mean to say that. <laughs> Texas first. Um, the other thing that I really love about these spots, or I know, right? Delete that from the recording. Um, so <laughs> one of the things that I really love about these spots is their use of the aisle markers at the very end. So they, you know, none of the none of the other references except for when he's making the delivery to the store. None of it is showing like the grocery store experience. It's all about the family, the Texas environment, those beautiful landscapes. Um, the the bridge there is an Austin bridge. Um, some of the generic ones that maybe anybody from anywhere Texas is going to be like, oh yeah, I recognize that, or that looks like my hometown. 
So then they use the aisle markers to remind you, hey, this is about your grocery store. And it's a grocery store where not only can you go there to find all of the things that you really need, but know that we're here for you. We're here to support the community. And HEB as a company does a really good job of delivering on that. Um, so they are, are very present in the community. They sponsor um, scholarships for students, educational grants. Last year when we had Hurricane Harvey come through, HEB was there with their products and services just like the Red Cross was, making sure that families had food and water and all of those supplies. So um, this is one of the ways that HEB really takes the, um, the Texas identity and celebrates it. So I mentioned that uh, Texas was a country before joining. We celebrate Texas Independence Day, uh, March 2nd. So there's a lot of rodeos that happen um, around that time. And so Texas, or HEB, created a whole um, text fest where they're celebrating that. So it's really not uncommon to see Texas-shaped products in um, college, in undergrad. I would often eat at the little, um, eat breakfast at the little um, coffee shop that we had on campus and we had Texas shaped waffles. And they are better. <laughs> they, taste, they taste better because they're shaped like my state. Um, there's uh, Texas shaped tortilla chips. There's a lot of Texas products that HEB sells. Texas sourced, they work with you know, local um, farmers and agriculture. Um, there's a huge emphasis on tex Texas community and a partnership with other Texas brands. So another one, I don't have clips of this, but um, another well-known Texas brand that has spread its wings throughout the lower um, half of the country is Whataburger. Who's had Whataburger? Okay. Oh, good. That's a good group of people. So Whataburger is an iconic Texas brand, started in Corpus Christi, and it uses a red and, or I'm sorry, orange and white brand. And so one of the things that HEB did was, um, well, let me step back. What a burger, what, what a burger fans um, love their ketchup. <laughs> so I don't know if it's like just amazing, but you know, it's something that people are like, oh, I'm gonna get the ketchup from Whataburger. So HEB used that and they partnered with Whataburger to sell Whataburger ketchup branded as Whataburger in the stores so that they can really um, maximize that. So they're one of my favorites. Um, another brand that does a really good job of maximizing their company culture or their brand uh, is NASA. And I had a, a, pri a privilege to see a couple of different presentations at the last South by Southwest with NASA folks, NASA communicators. And they're a really interesting brand because they, um, you know, it's a government agency. They don't have dollars to spend on advertising, so they really need to use the um, the, um, the, the power that their followers are gonna have. They have a lot of community-driven um, uh, social media, and <coughs> NASA fans are really die-hard, and they have a really horrible logo, but people will plaster that on everything so that you know that you support NASA and you know, all the things that come along with that. And the NASA mission is really, I'm gonna read it to you because it's really, um, it's their, their vision is really great. So it explains what they're all about. Their vision is to reach for new heights and reveal the unknown for the benefit of humankind. So NASA is all about learning and communicating what they learned. So they do that by really using the media um, that they have at their disposal. And I'm not gonna play this whole video, but I do want to show um, one of the ways that they do that, <coughs> which is, I'm gonna turn the volume down because don't, we don't really need to hear it, but NASA uses this um, 360. So this is their Jet Propulsion Laboratory. And um, what's really cool about this is anybody who watches this video can be a part of their experiment. So they are um, testing Mars rover here, and so they have a studio set up with a simulated Martian um, landscape, and so they can see how the equipment's gonna work, and it's a 360 video, so you can scroll. You can be a part of um, whatever this guy's doing with his computer in the back, using their little apples. You can scroll around, you can um, see the whole environment here, 
and um, here we go. They embed different uh, little um, information tips. They have videos embedded within the video, and they have, a, it, it's on mute right now, but they have a narrator who go, walks you through things, explains what the visual simulations are, so that you can really get the full experience. And this is a really good example of knowing your audience, because people who love NASA really want that information. They want to be a part of the experience, not just knowing you know, what the, that third party information is. They want to be a part of it. They want to know, hey, this is the seismometer and what it's doing you know, at this moment. They want to feel like they're there. So this is just another. They have a lot of these 360 videos. They do a 360 video for um, their launch days when they are launching new probes and um, satellites and things so that you can be in the, you know, in the control room there and see it from their experience. So that's just another way um, that NASA really kind of maximizes. That's the last video, so we don't have to do this back and forth thing anymore. Um, the other thing that NASA does, here we go, is they use social media. So I'm going to actually read this um, Instagram post that they had. This was back from um, May of this year. So, all eyes are on Jupiter. I emoji. Our NASA Juno spacecraft captured this image of Jupiter's southern hemisphere on the outbound leg of a close flyby of the gas giant planet. It's called a gas giant planet because its atmosphere is mostly made up of hydrogen gas and helium gas like the sun. This color-enhanced image was taken on May 24th as the spacecraft per performed its 13th close flyby of Jupiter. At the time, Juno was about 44,300 miles, 71,400 kilometers, from the planet's cloud tops, above the southern latitude of 71 degrees. Since July 4th, 2016, when Juno spacecraft successfully entered the orbit of Jupiter, we have been peering below a dense cover of clouds to answer the questions about the gas giant and the origins of our solar system. Then they credit who the photo was from, and then here's their gamut of hashtags. NASA, hashtag space, hashtag Juno, hashtag Jupiter, hashtag gas giant, hashtag planet, hashtag clouds, hashtag swirling, hashtag solar system, hashtag science, hashtag spacecraft, hashtag picture of the day. So what I love about this, and if you follow NASA on Instagram, you'll see a lot of this type of thing. They understand their audience who is craving that information, and they understand the user on Instagram. So they plaster their Instagram with beautiful, breathtaking images, and then they make sure that they beef it up with that really detailed information about what they're showing. So you not only get the experience of seeing it, you get the experience of learning a little bit more about it, maybe more than most people on Instagram would want to know, you know, that it was at 71 latitude, you know, that it was taken on this date, and that it was this distance away from the planet. Then they make sure that they use the maximum number of hashtags that they can, because that's what you're gonna get on Instagram. They use their eye emojis, and they use hashtags that show both the content and the, um, you know, the experience. So it's hashtag you know, the, the swirling pattern, hashtag picture of the day, so that they really get a cross section. Um, and so I think that NASA does a really good job of captivating um, their audience and using that, um, doubling down on their company culture, which is a nerd, which is awesome. Our last tip is Show your customers what they're paying for, and hint, it is not the product that you're selling. It is not the service that you're selling. What you really want to do is take it to that next level. Show them what the vision is that you have for their future. So you go beyond how you're solving their problems. You really want to show your customers what is the world in which they're living and how their life is better because you're a part of it. And so that takes you maybe to a different level. Um, it takes a little bit of thinking about what is, you know, your, you know, what is your company going to provide them. Um, and so this quote really from, from uh, Linda Boff, who's the CMO of General Electric, um, kind of gives you an insight into how they're doing that. Um, GE 
is not just about light. It's not just about um, appliances. GE really is trying to change the way that people are innovating and using technology and imagination. So that kind of um, takes you beyond just the product and the service that they're offering. And the way that they do that, the way that GE sells innovation, they partner with tech companies. So where they maybe um, don't have the full, um, the full resources on house, they go outside. So they've been working most recently with Apple and Amazon and some of those other tech companies um, to, to really kind of leverage that. And they were an early adopter and a heavy user of social media in a way that um, maybe doesn't come naturally if you're a, you know, a B2B or a brand that you know, is really kind of pushing beyond just that consumer um, experience. And they also want people to think about how their product or service is going to impact the end use. So I have a couple of examples here um, to show. One is their Snapchat. And I really, really love this, the Solstice one. So it, this one really is like the best um, crossroads here between GE thinking about light and the ultimate source of light, which is the sun. So, you know, celebrating the solstice and just, you know, using the platform for what it really is, which is fun and exciting and, you know, kind of goofy. And um, the other side over there is that they're really showing, again, that people connect with other people, so they're showing their, um, their engineers. They have a lot of uh, videos about showing what an engineer or a developer really looks like and getting that face of the, of the company in front of their audience. They also use uh, Pinterest, which I thought was really cool. I have just screenshots of two different of their boards. The top one is called Lighting the World. And if you really think back to GE and the, their experience with light, this is a really good example of that because who knows who, which light bulb brand those, all these lights are, but it really takes you to that different level where you can experience, okay, what is it like to, to be in this environment where you see those beautiful lights? So they have a bunch of different examples of um, lights throughout the world. Some are inside, some are outside, some are really fancy chandeliers, some are more uh, practical like uh, stadium lighting, those different types of experiences that light provides. Um, the bottom one is a little bit borderline a vision. You know, it's a, maybe a little bit more practical. But what I like about it is the, the Pinterest audience, there's a lot of um, home renovations and home uh, remodeling, decoration, that type of thing. So the Fabulous Kitchens is showing the GE products and services, but also kind of putting this, this, um, this forward thinking like, okay, well, what could my kitchen be like? What could my life be like if I was using these GE products? All right. Now we're going to get into um, just a quick little case study of the work that I've been doing um, at my current job. So I work at the Texas Association of School Boards. We call it TASB for short, so I'm going to say that because um, it's a, a mouthful. Um, and the Texas Association of School Boards, TASB, provides training, resources, um, a lot of uh, services to school board members in the state of Texas. It's a private nonprofit association, so schools don't have to join, but we do have and have had for the last 20 plus years 100% membership in the state of Texas, and there are over 1,000 school boards in Texas, um, or school districts in Texas. And so we only get about 5% of our revenue from our dues, our membership dues. The rest of it comes from supplemental um, products and services that we sell to the school districts, and one of the uh, the groups that we one of the products and services that we sell is insurance to the school districts. So that's where the TASB Risk Management Fund comes in. I know it's kind of a lot to follow there, but that's where I work. So I help market to potential uh, members of the TASB Risk Management Fund. And we have five different products that we sell, auto, property, liability, 
unemployment and work and workers compensation so we have all these different things that we can potentially sell to people it's b2b it's selling to governmental agencies it's school districts it's super boring <laughs> covers all those bases so we're at the crossroads of a couple major industries we have the insurance traditional insurance um, we actually don't use the insurance word because we're, we're technically legally different than that as a self-insured risk pool, but that's all. Our members don't care about that. You guys don't care about that. For all intents and purposes, it's insurance. It's also public education. So all of our members are public um, education school districts. We also sell to community colleges, and we also sell to some co-ops, but it's all in the name of public education. So um, last year, we kicked off a campaign that's called The Value of Membership. And we have done a couple of different strategies to promote that. So members do not have to purchase from us. We don't want everybody in the state of Texas to purchase from us. It's a little complicated because um, one of the things that's been going on over the past five years in Texas is we've had a lot of hail falling in the northern and western half of the state, and that causes a lot of expensive um, repairs to roofs, which we cover. <laughs> so we don't want all of the risk in the whole state, but we do want a good portion of it. So um, one of the things that we do is we use the numbers um, some of the stats and, and data behind um, our membership to make the case that you, uh, as a potential member, should join the fund. We try and use our members' voices and our members' uh, testimonials to, to, to make that case. So when we have happy customers, when we have school districts who go through really difficult and um, uh, overwhelming experiences, like we've had um, actually just la this year, in um, spring break, we had a member who had a school-sponsored trip to um, Disney World. On the way back, they got in a really bad car accident or bus accident. Their, um, the bus flipped over and you know students were injured and they were, it was in Alabama, so it was not in our state. They were on the way back. We had to deal with a lot of different things related to that. And so um, we wanted to really show that we were there for them. We offered a crisis grant so that they could, um, so that they could get the parents to their kids, you know, and get them from all these different locations and cover the cost of travel, things like that. So we really want to share, share those stories. You know, yes, you had this really horrible thing happen. How was the TASB Risk Management Fund there to help you through it? We really play up the, the fact that we work specifically with public education. Um, a lot of our competitors maybe have other groups that they work with, maybe other governmental agencies, other um, municipalities that they work with. So we really want to showcase that we are the experts in the public education um, realm. So we play up the partnership with the Texas Association of School Boards. It's a really complicated um, partnership there. It's TAS, the TASB Risk Management Fund is a separate entity. So we kind of, um, we have to show that we're connected. We have all that access, but we're also different. Um, and then we also, we go beyond just talking about insurance services, because that's not something that is really going to get people to purchase from us. We want to show that at the end of the day, we are supporting happy, healthy, safe learning environments for Texas students. So we use a lot of imagery that's related to that. We don't show business um, interactions, because that's not you know, the vision that we're wanting to show. We're showing a lot of happy students, like I showed in that first picture, um, running and, and excited to, to go to school, which we all are. Um, so these are just some snapshots of some of the ads that we've done. Going back to our, this morning's presentation about diversity and inclusion, Texas students are extremely diverse. We have, um, I think it was like, I'm going to screw up the numbers. I'm not even going to try. But <laughs> we always make sure that we have um, different ethnicities shown, um, a variety of different types of students, different ages, that type of thing, because it really reflects the actual students that our, our members are, are 
you know, um, have in their classes. So these are some of the stats that we use. We've been around for more than 40 years. Um, the TASB Risk Management Fund was actually created in 1974 because of a law that mandated that Texas schools needed to offer workers' compensation insurance, and traditional carriers did not want to car carry that risk. So the, the TASB created its own pool, and so we've been around for more than 40 years. We have five programs, and we're very happy to say that over the past five years, we've had at least 99% member satisfaction. They love us, so we share that number a lot. <laughs> Um, this year, we even though we've been around and our initial program was workers' compensation, that actually is the smallest um, volume program that we have. So we were really trying to push that this year. And we get a lot of third-party data from the Texas Department of Insurance, Texas Workforce Commission, all of those other agencies that can show that working with the um, TASB Risk Management Fund saves them money and gets their employees back to work quicker which in turn saves more money, which is what our schools are really looking for because the, their budgets are very tight. So we use a lot of communications about you know, uh, the cost savings, the time savings. They have a lot of different jobs that they're doing. So these, again, we have um, some imagery around that, playing up the, again, even with the middle one, you know, the ad return to work rate, we're showing chalk. A lot of these um, have a gray chalkboardy look to them, so even if we are not talking specifically about schools, we're kind of implying it. So even on the far left one with the stethoscope, it kind of fits with that, um, that look. These are a couple of quotes that we got from members. Actually, the, the one on the left, the insurance is never something you want to deal with. That one is um, from a member who works at a school district, and it was unsolicited. So we really look for those opportunities where, where all of those uh, moments where members are highlighting the positive experience they've had with us, we want to capture those and then you know, share them out again. So it was a much longer email that we got from the member where they were talking about, oh, well, every time we did this, we got this, and it was so awesome, and blah, blah, blah. Well, the real, we pulled out the nugget from that and said, okay, well, what can we, um, how can we share that out again? So that was just a little social post we did. Um, this one was um, based on a phone call that I had with the, um, this officer, um, Chris Hernandez worked at Austin Community College and he was injured on the job and he had a really difficult, um, uh, journey through his recovery. He had multiple surgeries. He had a lot of um, a lot of things that he had to go through. And our workers' compensation. Uh, you may not know this about workers' compensation, but the claims are for life. So every injury afterward, we evaluate whether or not that was a part of you know um, the original injury. So we often are paying for the life of the person on those claims. So it's not just one and done. They're with us you know, for the rest of their lives. And so they, are, they have a really long tail. So it's really about um, that relationship that we foster. So his adjuster was there with him. He was, um, he was awarded because of his injury was related to something that you know, he did on the job. And so she went to his award ceremony for this thing. So she really was a, a valuable part of his emotional recovery as well as his physical recovery. So we wanted to make sure that we told his story and we're, we're really um, showcasing that. Um, again, like I said, we really sh play up the identity that's related to school districts. So that's the TASB logo. That's um, pretty well known throughout the Texas um, public school um, arena. And then the, on the right here are just some icons that we use both in print and on our website. And um, we're starting to put them in a bunch of different places so that people recognize, hey, you know, these are related to school districts. Um, PowerPoints, sales material, all of that stuff. And then the final piece that I'll show is every year we do an annual report. And this is mostly internal. It goes to our board, which is a 19-member board that runs the, the fund. And it shows how well we did over the year, what's our financial statement, all the stuff that's in a traditional annual report. Well, instead of showcasing um, imagery that's related to you know, 
the products and services that we offer, we again try to infuse it with the, the happy children who are learning. And this one was a kind of a space theme this year, uh, member focused, mission driven, the double entendre there with a mission. Um, and so we have these kind of happy space themed kids throughout. And um, all of the imagery is again showing that, reinforcing that, that at the end of the day, we're here for the kids. So we're going to recap our tips. In case you didn't write them down before, you can write them down now. Number one, use a spokesperson. That could be internal. Um, it could be an influencer. It can be a created fictional character. Tell your customer stories, because they're going to be the most authentic, um, real, valuable um, stories that you can tell. Double down on your company culture. If you have a weird, unique, um, characteristic about your company, use that. That's going to be the most, um, that's going to be something that people really tag onto. Um, and then show your customers what they're paying for. And again, it's not your product or service, it's that vision that you have for them. And that's it. That's me. And if you need to find me, you can find me there. Questions? 